In the Army or in the military in general, there's a saying, you'll know when it's time to go. I knew at about 21 years in that it was time for my new chapter, and I had to figure out quickly what that was going to be. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Truth be told, I wanted to actually open up a Cuban restaurant, name it A Taste of Havana. I wanted to combine my passion with my strong work ethics and open up business. I've always been into fitness. and health from a very young age, always into sports. I have a passion for teaching. Probably, truth be told, if I wasn't in the fitness business, I'd probably be a teacher. If you think about it, it's interesting. I didn't know that about you, but it makes sense because really coaches are teachers, right? Providing guidance and a blueprint and accountability so, you know, that the shoe fits. I said, you know, I just had this wild idea. How about if I open up a gym? Welcome to the Fitness CEO Podcast. Hey friends, welcome back to another amazing episode of the Fitness CEO Show. This show is for high performers that teach you to lead so that way you can 10X your income, your impact, and your legacy. If you're new to the show, my name is Bryce Henson. I am your Fitness CEO and I'm here with my good friend, Junior Oliveira. Junior, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Appreciate it, Bryce. Thank you. Well, you've been a longtime friend for many years. Uh, have a couple locations here on the East Coast in Georgia, but uh, we're actually shooting this live from Miami, Florida. We're uh, launching a mastermind, and you're not from Miami, but you grew up here. Uh, interestingly enough, you're from Cuba. So I actually want to start the, the journey there, um, where you grew up, and then I guess you know how you transitioned from Cuba to the States, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about that backstory there. So how did that all came to be? Yeah, so like you said, I was born in uh, Havana, Cuba, and uh, at the age of five, uh, my father uh, had the opportunity to bring us to America uh, during what was called uh, the Mariel boat lift. Back in uh, 1980, we left in May of 1980. Uh, Fidel Castro opened up Cuba for those who were seeking asylum in the United States under political refugee status. And uh, Jimmy Carter, the president at the time, uh, they had an agreement. and. Um, my dad brought uh, my grandmother, his mom, my mother, uh, my, one of my younger sisters, my only sister at the time, but uh, myself, uh, my aunt, my uncle, and two of my cousins. And uh, we made the journey from uh, Cuba to America back in May of 1980. And you were a five-year-old boy? Yes. So you probably don't remember too much. I do wanna actually ask a little bit about maybe some stories that your parents told you about what Cuba was like, but do you remember actually the time, the moment in time that you left? And can you elaborate there? Yes, I, uh, I vaguely remember we left in uh, total darkness because uh, the Cuban people were upset with, or some of the Cuban people were upset with us fleeing or leaving Cuba to America. Uh, so we had to leave in total darkness, but even then, as a, as a young boy, I remember footsteps in the dark leaving. People were throwing eggs at us, calling us names like gusano, which in English is, means worm. Uh, so we left in darkness. I remember getting to, I'm assuming, what was the in-processing place in Cuba mm -hmm. and just seeing bright lights, taking pictures. Uh, and then other than that, I remember being on the boat it seemed like it was months probably, but it was, I'm assuming it was probably a day or two yep. from uh, Cuba to Key West. So we processed in Key West, uh, and then from there they shipped us out to Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania. And then uh, from there we were claimed by family and friends that were out in California, in Los Angeles. Your family and friends? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. My dad had some uh, family, I had two, actually I had two older brothers that were already living in Los Angeles. They came from Cuba years ago before uh, I did. Um, and and uh, let me interject, all your family's from Cuba, your parents, yes. born and raised and all that. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get transported to Key West, you have some family and friends out in California and then you ship over there. Correct. Okay. Uh, we stayed there for about a year and a half before transitioning back to Florida. We went to Miami where uh, my dad had some friends, could get him a job, get us secured there. Uh, and we did that trip back and forth uh, between Miami and LA probably about three or four times before I finally uh, settled with my grandmother in Miami. She had stayed in Miami. Uh, so I stayed there from about the age of 11 
till age of 20 when I enlisted in the United States Army. Oh wow, so you went back to Miami after your family was kind of traveling out in LA, et cetera, but then from 11 to 20, you live with your grandma. Correct. Not with your parents. Correct, yeah. Where were they? They, they stayed in Miami, but at the time, uh, my dad and mom had three other kids um, before, uh, after coming to America. Okay. So we didn't always have the best uh, things growing up, mm -hmm. um, which kind of, I think, shaped me into uh, what we'll talk about here later. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I decided it was best for, for me to just move in with my grandmother, help her out, uh, and help me out as well. You had that vision at 11 years old? Yes. And I would imagine, is your grandma still with us? No, she's not. Okay, she, but yeah. I'm sorry to hear, um, but I would imagine, is it fair to say you developed a really strong relationship with her? Definitely, definitely. She uh, definitely had an impact in, in my development as a young man and uh, into my... In what way? What would you say, maybe one or two things that you really took, took away from her? Just, uh, I would say her, her, her values, her um, ethics about how she you basically did what she could with what she had. Mm -hmm. um, it, it shaped me into, uh, I think they call it the immigrant edge. Yeah. Strong work ethics, yeah, yeah. Um, values, you know, honesty. Uh, so she, I think she definitely had an impact in my uh, upbringing. You lived with her till you were 20, and at that point you, you transitioned to the military. Correct. So I want to talk about that because this podcast is about personal growth and leadership and transitions and whatnot. Also, we'll go there in a second. But uh, this is very passion to me. We were just talking about you know this off camera. But uh, I'm a, I'm a pro business capitalist. I'm against socialism. I'm against communism. And I didn't live it. You certainly did. So I want to actually you know inquire a little bit more. But one of the things I remember growing up is my grandma and her family, my great grandparents escaped communist Poland. And my grandma was this amazing lady. Um, and uh, I, I was always curious when I was 10 years old, like I started asking myself these questions. Why are my cousins and these other people like doing crazy things to immigrate to other worlds, you know, can't even speak the language, trying to escape where they're after? And that really kind of started my mindset around, okay, studying economics and studying capitalist, you know, uh, type of economic system versus socialism or communism and seeing the, the, the really horrific, horrific effects of, of communism, as an example. And your family obviously lived through that. So you were a young boy because you just kind of, you know, shared and transitioned out. But um, I'm curious if you remember any stories from your parents kind of talking about, you know, what their life was in Cuba. Yeah, I mean, again, they were oppressed, um, like we said. Uh, there was only um, very little, I guess, you know, you living off of socialism, you were given what uh, you were given mm -hmm. and you had to do with what you, you had. Did, they, did you have a lot of aunts and uncles? Did they come from like a lot of siblings or was it just one or two in the family? As far as my aunts and uncles? Yeah, like well, if your parents, did they have a bunch of siblings? Like, I'm just curious, like, are there big families? Or yeah, my just... dad had the bigger uh, of, of the family. Yeah, I, uh, matter of fact, um, I had some cousins and other family members that fled Cuba way after I, we did um, that went to kind of some of the things uh, that we had to go through, they actually had to get on uh, rafts to, to make their way in their journey to, from Cuba to the United States. Um, so yeah, it's definitely tough uh, growing up in a communist socialist uh, country yeah and what even to this day like yeah do, i'm curious if you you know chat with your parents about you know their experience and all that like if if, if you were to ask if your parents were with us and you were to ask them like what was it like growing up in cuba what would you what would their their response be pretty challenging i would i would say uh again not not having an opportunity at freedoms or you know freedom of speech mm -hmm. is definitely one or uh having an opportunity to make um, ends meet, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I mean, if you talk to people that are from Cuba currently, they're, they're, Cuba's in shambles, there's mm -hmm. nothing there. Um, so there's a lot of hustle and bustle, which again, I think uh, a as an immigrant, you, you quickly learn to have a strong work ethics to make oh, yeah. ends meet, be creative, be resourceful. It's like the immigrant edge. We were just talking Correct. about that. And, and my family comes from that immigrant edge, you know, mentality. And you certainly do as well. So it's funny they say about free speech. And we were just talking about this off camera. Um, but uh, I just met last week a lady. Her name is Petra, a new friend of mine. She's going to be on this podcast. So get excited for that sometime later this year. But she grew up in communist East Germany. She was 23 years old when the Berlin Wall uh, fell. And she waited 10 hours with her family to just go through that like small crack in the wall 
called a taste capitalism. And when I asked her what it was like in, in communist East Germany, her initial response was it was laden with fear because you couldn't say anything because the freedom of speech was censored and you didn't know if someone was going to report you. In fact, she had, she had a neighbor that was reported um, who made a joke and ended up going to jail because he said something against the communist regime. And so the fact that you just said free speech is just something that just came up to me, which is a very commonality um, you know, in that type of environment. So I appreciate you sharing. Yeah. All right, so now you, know, you transitioned. Uh, you're a grown man now, 20 years old, and uh, now you set off to the military. So I'm curious, what was that like? What made that decision? Um, so can you, you know, color in the details there? Yeah, I, I always wanted to uh, give back to the country that gave us the opportunity of uh, freedom and, and living the American dream. So I always wanted to either be law enforcement, military. Uh, I saw that as a way of serving and giving back uh, and, and paying my dues, I guess. That's what you felt? Yeah, yeah, I felt that. I had a good mentor and told me like, hey, go ahead and live your dream. Go, go do what you want to do. So I joined, uh, I enlisted in the United States Army back in uh, February of 1995 out of Miami uh, and at the time I was just a resident of the United States not a full citizen and with being a, a, a resident your your options are limited so my options and I only went in for a two-year uh, contract okay uh, at the time so my recruiter told me uh, your options are basically combat arms and I'm like okay what is that I had no yeah. idea so he's like you can be an infantryman or you can be a tanker uh, so I was like, infantry, man, what is that? So uh, I figured out that was a foot soldier. So I said, okay, I'll walk for two years uh, and see how this thing goes. Um, so I, I was shipped off to Fort Benning, Georgia, which ironically is where I, I reside now, actually, in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, and uh, started my military career there back in April of uh, 1995. Uh, I graduated basic training from there. From there, I was shipped off to uh, my first duty station as an infantryman in uh, Camp Greaves, Korea. Really? Uh, which was uh, on, a, on a nice day, we can see the North Korean flag waving at us really? from our post. So it was, uh, we were yeah, about two miles away from the demilitarized zone, the DMZ. Holy smokes, man. Yeah. You've had some touches with communism in your life. Yes, uh, and that was a scary, scary moment, right? Like we were basically on high alert constantly there in, North, mm -hmm. in uh, Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, and then again from there, I, uh, what turned into uh, what started out as two years uh, turned out to be 22 years. Shortly after leaving Korea, uh, I got stationed in uh, Fort Hood, Texas and um, got married to uh, my current wife, Anna. Uh, 27 years, proud of that. Oh, congratulations. Um, and then we just, uh, again, 22 years later, um, had an amazing career, uh, learned a, a lot of valuable lessons and values uh, that come with being a military uh, serviceman. What would you say, looking back at your career, was the, the military career was the biggest challenge and then what would you say was the biggest highlight? Uh, definitely the biggest highlight is uh, the time I did in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. I was, uh, after I was deployed to uh, Iraq, Operation Iraqi Freedom, spent 15 months there helping the Iraqi people uh, liberate you know, what they had going on. Yep. Um, I, got, uh, I volunteered to become a, a drill sergeant because uh, I knew that uh, my passion is is helping others, coaching, teaching, mm -hmm. mentoring. So uh, drill sergeant duty was definitely something that I, I wanted to do. Um, so that was my biggest, I think, uh, accomplishment, I guess, or uh, was being a, a drill sergeant. Yeah. Long hours, um, three and a half years, it, was, it filled my cup. It, um, it was a great feeling to help basically civilians um, transition them to infantrymen, which is, again, ironically what happened to me, right? I, I, you went through that transition. Exactly, I yeah. went through that same transition. So uh, that was the most fulfilling uh, duty um, that I had in the military service. As far as challenge, um, I would say being deployed twice to Iraq, leaving my family behind, uh, you know, with all the uncertainties, especially my first deployment to Iraq, uh, I was gone 
for 15 months straight. Mm -hmm. uh, and back then in 2003, I mean, it was uh, snail mail, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, by the time you got a piece of letter, it was 30 days, 45 oh, yeah. days later. Um, so there was no uh, what we got now, social media and, you know, uh, access to phones. Mm -hmm. Uh, Instant but, messaging, yeah. I mean, any message is uh, nearly two months delayed. So definitely that was the biggest challenge. I left my daughter, who was 15 months at the time. When I got back, she was uh, 30 months. And um, there was a slight moment there that she had forgotten who I was. Really? Yeah, which really was... Uh, Humbling. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, through time, she, she, she knew who dad was. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, that was definitely the biggest, uh, I think, challenge so far in my military career was, was leaving my family behind. Not once, but twice. Well, thank you for your service, first and foremost. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Um, oh, your story, like, teared me up a little bit. That's, uh, it's incredible. It's incredible what people will do to, re you know, remove themselves from oppression. And then in your case, pay it forward. You know, the, the fact that you had the opportunity through your father, you know, to get the hell out of Dodge uh, in a very communist ridden, you know, country like Cuba, and then, you know, show up here and be a productive member of society, which is, you know, I have a lot of respect for in the immigrant edge. And, and then also that you gave back. So as we transition, I'm curious kind of, you know, as your military career concluded and kind of what your next, you know, step was, if you will, uh, before we go there, one last question about the military. What would you say is a skill set or two that you learned and developed in the military that you've actually carried through that's benefited you as an entrepreneur, as a, as a fitness business owner? I would say definitely the ability to, of taking initiative uh, definitely propelled me not only in my military career, but in life. Uh, always going above and beyond what's expected, taking action, uh, when nobody else does, that, that definitely gave me, and it was easy for me, it was kind of something that, that I always had, right? Do more than what's expected. Mm -hmm. um, don't wait to be told to do things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think definitely that, and then the leadership by example, which is, uh, I'll talk probably a little bit more, but leadership by example, I, I definitely feel as if I can't ask others to do what I'm not willing to do. So definitely uh, leading or doing the things that, that we ask other people to do mm -hmm. um, is definitely two big things that I've taken from my military career and kind of in my civilian or business life now. Yeah, incredible. And I know the military is known for strong leadership. You need to, and that's just a skill that I absolutely love. I love people first and foremost, and I love working in teams. And what I've realized is you know, we have a team of people working towards a common goal, a common objective. You can do so much. And that really, you know, um, stems on and falls on leadership, right? Uh, so I appreciate you developing those skills and that insight that you've taken with you. Now I want to transition kind of what was like, uh, what was the transition out of the military like and, you know, how you ended up becoming a fitness business owner, a fit body owner. So if you can kind of share a little bit about that transition. Yeah, um, I would say that uh, my transition from military to civilian uh, life or business owner uh, was definitely not an easy one. But uh, in the Army or in the military in general, there's a saying, you'll know when it's time to go. And it's very, very true. I, I knew at uh, about 21 years in that it was time for my new chapter. Uh, and I had to figure out quickly what that was gonna be. Um, so as I was thinking or, uh, or wondering what I was gonna do, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur or had that entrepreneur seed mm -hmm. in me at, uh, at a very early age. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, truth be told, I wanted to actually uh, open up a Cuban restaurant. Really? Uh, restaurant? Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, and uh, name it A Taste of Havana. Uh, but as uh, things happen, that, that hasn't happened yet. And I wanted to say, okay, what, do, what am I passionate about? All right? I wanted to combine my passion with my strong work ethics and open a, a, a business. So I knew I've always been into fitness and okay. health uh, from a very young age, always into sports. Even before the military? Correct, okay. always into sports. I, I grew up uh, in, in Miami playing basketball, even though I'm five foot four. Uh, <laughs> I made up with, with I, I believe, 
IQ and, and speed and my defense and dribbling abilities and football. Uh, you know, back then, growing up in the 80s, uh, early 90s, I kept kids out of trouble, you know, especially in Miami where people think, oh, you know, oh, yeah. inner city, lots, lots of ways to get in trouble. So I grew up uh, playing sports in, in school as well. I actually wrestled one year. Um, but I was always into fitness, health. I have a passion for teaching. I, uh, probably, truth be told, if I wasn't in the fitness business, I'd probably be a teacher uh, mentoring uh, young kids. If you think about it, it's interesting. I didn't know that about you, but it makes sense because really from a fitness professional, like w w coaches are teachers, right? You're providing guidance and a blueprint and accountability. So, you know, that the shoe fits. That's right. Correct. Yeah. Um, so I, I said, you know, I just had this wild idea. How about if I open up a gym, you know, and you I thought this teach. before you transitioned out. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So I, what I did was I said, okay, hey, I can open up a gym. I love to teach. Uh, I, um, I know fitness. Mm -hmm. I had the background. Um, so I just combined them both and uh, ran across this uh, gentleman called Bedros Koulian <laughs> in one of his YouTube ads or uh, videos. Now let me ask you this. Were you proactively looking for the opportunity or did you just kind of show up? It showed up. So I was just looking for, searching for how to open a Jim. So there was some proactivists in yes. it. It just so happened that, well, the algorithm, because yes. you found Bedros because you were actually searching for Correct. Bedros even unknowingly at the time. Yeah. And I knew I, I, knew I needed to go with a franchise because I, I had no knowledge mm -hmm. of running a business, mm -hmm. running, a, opening a gym. Um, so I found him, started watching more film and video on him and mm -hmm. getting to know a little bit about Fit Body Bootcamp. What year was this roughly? This was uh, 2016. Okay. Yeah, 2016, um, when, I, when I ran across him. And um, so what I did was, in, in, in order to prepare, I actually uh, was training my wife and some of her friends uh, in the local gym on post in Hawaii. Um, you're stationed My there. last duty station was Hawaii. So I was uh, just telling you off, off camera, you're like an onion. I've known you for years. Every time I connect with you, there's find out something very interesting that's new. Yeah, I had the pleasure of uh, going out to Hawaii um, as an infantry first sergeant, which uh, Hawaii was beautiful when I had the time. Mm -hmm. uh, as a first sergeant, you're in charge of a 163-man company, infantry company. So I had very little time mm -hmm. to leisure. Um, but going back to the, how I ended up in the, in the fitness, um, so I was training them right before I got out. I approached, I have actually a, a pretty uh, cool story. Um, my sergeant major, who's uh, in charge of the, the battalion in, in a in a unit, um, when I asked her, when I approached her and said, hey, I think I'm finally done, I'm gonna retire. She asked me, well, what are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. And uh, my answer to her was, I'm gonna open up my own gym. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of encouraging me, she kind of gave me that like, are you kidding me? Is that what you're gonna do? So I think that kind of lit a little fire under my, my behind to to prove her yeah, yeah. that I I am gonna do it and you know seven years later here I am two locations so if you're watching boom there you go that's awesome I'm gonna drill into a little bit about you know, Anna you said you're tra training your wife who's here today by the way behind the scenes so shout out to you Anna but um, what was her kind of demeanor when you know when you're kind of had this aha you start searching you know and you're planning the next move and you, sh you should showcase to her like your thought and your goal. Was she supportive? Uh, did she have concern? Um, we'd love to kind of hear the back end conversation. My wife's been, uh, again, we've been married for 27 years. She's uh, the rock, right? Um, what the, the saying is behind uh, or in front of every man or behind every man, there's a strong woman. That's it. Like I that. just said this earlier today. Um, yeah. and, and that's her, right? She's been there. Like when I told her that I, I think it was time for us to transition from military to uh, civilian life, she was right there. She was supportive. If that's what you want to do, well, you know, that's what we'll do. Um, so she was very supportive of my uh, decision to retire and open up a, uh, a fitness gym. Awesome. So as you're kind of researching and all that, what was the, the, the time and I guess how did you take the leap of faith? Yeah, so uh, when, I, when I told my Sergeant Major that I was retiring, uh, I had approximately 10 months left in the military. Um, so we put in the paperwork, uh, had to get an exception 
to the policy because you got to give them at least 12 months. Okay. And I was under that. But uh, they, I just asked her to please give me time to prepare for my next endeavors in life. And uh, I was put on 24 hours of work with 48 hours off. So I took that opportunity uh, to get uh, more information mm -hmm. on, on opening a, a franchise. I, uh, I applied, you know how the process mm -hmm. goes. I applied and, and thankfully and gratefully, I was given the opportunity uh, of getting a, uh, a location, territory. And um, if I heard you correctly, you were in Hawaii at the time? Correct. So then how did you put it together? Cause you're, you know, Jim's uh, Fit by Location is open in Georgia. So how'd that come to be? Yeah, so before I uh, was stationed in Hawaii, I had the uh, privilege of being in, in Columbus, Georgia for eight and a half years. So we had a house Oh. already we had some uh time in columbus georgia had friends and stuff so what we decided going through the process was we originally wanted to go one of the areas that we wanted to go was san antonio texas hmm. uh, but we decided to go back to columbus georgia just because we i felt as if we had a lot of things going right i was transitioning from the military uh, with all that uncertainty yep. uh, opening up a new business fitness uh, location uh, and there was a lot going on. So we were like, let's just go back to Columbus, Georgia, uh, where we know people, we mm -hmm. have some support, we have a home. You have some community, yeah, correct. which is actually like a secret sauce of Fit Body, what that's you produce right. to your clients, and that uh, community is important. So that made that decision, that's how we ended up in, in Columbus, Georgia, going back to Columbus, Georgia from Hawaii. So we were basically prepping from Hawaii, going back to uh, Columbus, Georgia. And then, so you scope everything out, you decide from Hawaii, you scope everything out, you're gonna launch a fit body in Georgia, and then it came to be. Correct. So walk me through um, actually the transition from an identity perspective, because I think it's important you know, for our audience who you know, is interested in opening a business, a passion-based business, whenever you transition to something new, you actually lo lose something, you leave something behind. And Junior, I'm hearing your story, you, you were in the service for how long, 20 years? 22. 22 years, thank you again. So that's a long time, right? You learned a lot, you grew a lot, your identity had to be wrapped up in that for over two decades. So what was the challenging part of like losing that identity and how did you feel, how did you process through then you know, getting on the other side and becoming a gym owner? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, I would say, the first thing, the, the identity, what in the military, you're basically told where to be, when to be, mm -hmm. what to wear. You have a set structured uh, life. Oh yeah. Uh, when you get out into the civilian world, you gotta figure that out quickly. Uh, I, I call it the FIO, figure it out. Uh, so that was definitely a big challenge is the the structure and the organization and, and how to stay or remain disciplined with your time because now you don't have that set structure. You got to figure out what that structure looks like, especially opening up your own business. Did that factory install of having structure, that that help you though? Yeah, it definitely did. Uh, I, I mean, I, I wasn't blinded by, by the fact of the not having the structure. It was just creating your new structure. Creating it, yeah. That's right. Um, so that definitely helped me from the military side into the, the, the civilian side is having that structure and that discipline. Did you have like an identity crisis or was it a pretty smooth transition? I think that I don't think I had an identity crisis. Okay. I think I just used some of my military leadership lessons and skills and attributes and transitioned over to, to being a, a gym owner. And I guess transitioning, what was that like? So let's talk about the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, anytime you launch something new, uh, and certainly with support, although in 2016, 17, was it? 17. 17, it was definitely a different time frame uh, compared to even today in 2024. Oh, yes. uh, we've added a lot more infrastructure and support, which is, you know, continue on, which is great. Um, but what was, what was launching gym like, the challenges, like the good, the bad, and the ugly? We'd love that real authentic experience. So uh, it started, you know, at back, back in 17, I went to university in California in the old headquarters. Uh, uh, and I met some, some good friends of mine who I call friends still to this day. Oh, cool. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the challenges of not knowing what we were getting ourselves into, mm -hmm. uh, the support system, like you said, back then, there was some support, but not compared, nothing compared to what it is today. 
Um, so in the beginning, it was really challenging because like we probably all know, we were, I, I was basically with my wife's support, I was a one man show. Yep. Uh, Coaching all the sessions. Doing and, everything, yeah, yeah. We did that for, uh, which is I think is probably the biggest challenge if you were to ask me was for 18 months straight, it was just me. Uh, me and my wife. Yeah. But actually, there's a good point. I want to lean into that because a lot of times, you know, within our brand, not always, but a lot of times, you know, someone comes with a partner or spouse um, and works out really well. Sometimes it doesn't. And I think one of the big things that really helps with that is if the partner has clear expectations. Okay, what are you accountable for? What are, you know, uh, am I accountable for? How did that work out, you know, then and even to this day in terms of accountability, your working relationship? When you say partner, you mean like your spouse? Your spouse, okay. specifically, yeah. Um, again, we, we had very little knowledge, if any, of running a business. Mm -hmm. um, but what helped us was the, the lessons that I've gone through in life and in the military. Um, we were just, you know, resilient, uh, figuring things out mm -hmm. as we went, uh, asking tons of questions. Mm -hmm for people that were in the industry. Did you have like a, uh, an area of accountability? Like you were coaching all the sessions and then she would, she would do like the back end operations? Yes. Like how did that, would that split? Yeah, that's, that's uh, to me and I, to this day, I still tell my team uh, and people about this. The, she had all the hard part. She had the, the billing stuff, uh, all the administrative tasks, uh, getting uh, all the, the, uh, credit cards, information, all of that. That's the hard stuff. I had what I, even though they were long hours and a lot of sessions, I thought that was, that, that came easy to me. Yeah. So I, I took care of uh, all the coaching sessions, all the selling, um, marketing, although she did do some of the marketing for us mm -hmm. when, when, again, we had no clue uh, of what we were essentially doing with marketing. Um, but yeah, she, she did all the hard stuff, all the back end stuff, the stuff that isn't glamorous and people don't really see. Oh yeah. Uh, it's super important. For very important. I mean, it's, it's, it's the operations of, of the, the business, I believe. Oh know? yeah. hundred percent. So even though you were new in entrepreneur space, still figuring it out, you did, you know, from a leadership perspective, had, you know, that strong background and was able to clearly communicate and clearly divide your lane. So that way Anna had her accountability and you had yours and it, the ship worked. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I guess, you know, fast forward, um, or at least taking a 30,000 foot view, if you look back at that experience, you know, the first couple of years of getting it off the ground, what was like the biggest highlight, would you say? And then what was the biggest low light? The biggest highlight, um, I would just say, I mean, I was passionate about what I was doing, right? Like, even though, again, uh, for such a long time, 18 months, I didn't even really think about what we were doing, like what I was doing, like all the until years later and even today, I still look at it and have conversations with my, my team and my coaches. And I'm like, you know, when, when people talk about burnout and this, and I'm like, man, for 18 months, I was the guy, mm -hmm. right? So I, I and, and I, again, I don't say that to brag, but it was just the passion. I was full of that and having my own, what we call our own baby, our own yeah. gym. Um, so that was definitely probably the highlight is just having, your own something you call yours right that you create uh, that yes. you built that your foundation and then the uh the other question was just uh, low lighter challenge yeah yeah i'm i mean it's almost like a, a two I, I would say yeah finding finding team members that had the same vision and passion that you have to helping others through fitness um we we didn't i didn't have that for 18 months took you a little um, time to spin up I want to drill back into just to be able to create some specificity around like your passion. So when you talk about pa your passion about the business, first first eighteen months, you're doing the thing, connecting, running all the sessions. Junior, what about it specifically? Is it the client interaction? Is it like the physical, you know, transformations? Is it the, I mean, what specifically about it like fueled your passion? And the reason I ask that because you know, outside eyes looking in, it could probably be the 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 business, anything in life probably is a little bit different than what it looks like in the outside in. So, what specifically were you really passionate about? I would say the impact that you have on others um, is what what the passion that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Like that fills you uh, yeah, with energy that, and helping others, you know, especially when they, when they come up to you and you say, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for changing my life. Thank you for impacting my, my life in this way. 
definitely that's the passion that I'm talking about, the, the developing and helping others, serving others, yep. selfless service, which again, I learned from the military side of my career or life. Um, to kind of put a bow on it, and same question, but I, I want to drill back into working with Anna, your spouse, who's been obviously a huge um, reason for your success, um, because a lot of new franchise partners coming through, they do you know work with their spouse, which is which can be really incredible. What would you say was is has been the biggest highlight of you working together? And then let's be real, what's been the biggest challenge as well? And I say that because I work with my wife, we have a beautiful relationship, but not all everything's fun, sunshines and rainbows. We know this, so I want to get the real authentic uh, glimpse. I would say uh, working with my wife, just the support, right? Like having somebody always there to listen to, to you, whether it's, you know, you had a great day or whether it was not, not such a great day. She's like, has uh, your back, yeah. she's like in your corner. Uh, and, and to keep me kind of that compass, right? Steering the ship, she like brings me back. Um, I would say the biggest challenge, and we kind of joke about this, uh, you know, from time to time is just, uh, we don't, we don't have the same ideas, right? Uh, sometimes. And what I think, uh, is, is the way that we should do things. Sometimes she's like, no, no, no. I, I think differently. Um, sometimes she's more direct with people and I'm like, I try to like, Hey hun, you gotta soften. A little. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta, talk a little bit like this well no 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 that's not who I am and I'm like I understand that but it's it's a part about like learning how to deal with people yeah. people skills uh, which is you know at the end that's what that's the business we're in that's relationships and, and uh, dealing with people even more so than fitness that's I'd right say. that's right yeah so but yeah I wouldn't change it for uh, for anything in the world uh, I love doing what I do with my wife um, and having that support, which, you know, I mean, now that I think about it, like we have two kids and kids are, are seeing what their parents are doing. Oh yeah. You know, so both of my kids are, are active and, and, and living a healthy, what I believe a healthy lifestyle. How old are they? Uh, my daughter is 22. She just graduated uh, college and my son's uh, 17. He's about to graduate high school. Congrats. Thank you. What a story. Well, um, on that note, uh, we still have a little bit more time for the bonus round, but uh, out, Junior, I want to appreciate you and thank you for kind of telling your story, telling the foundation, the challenges, the transition, the identity, all your experience, which is part of the process and your know, leadership experience and you know, identity and transition. That's what, that's what the name of this game is in entrepreneurship and business. So I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Um, in terms of the bonus round, so 60 seconds or less, just what comes to mind. Uh, Junior, from your perspective, what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? Being an entrepreneur uh, gives me, but more importantly, other people the opportunity uh, to live out their dreams and passions. Uh, next up, who is your biggest hero? And the flip side, who's your biggest enemy? I don't know. I would say uh, like Captain America. When I, when I think of hero, I think of like Captain America. And, and I, the reason I say that when I see him or, or think of him, it's like, you know, very proud, uh, selfless service, helping mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of see myself with my military background in life kind of being that way. I kind of joke with my team, like I'm the captain of the ship and you know, I, I start with hey, the captain speaking and, uh, but I would say Captain America just cause the, the overall uh, perception or just what he, what he believes in and what he does for other people. Yeah, I think we can all aspire to that. But the flip side, who's your biggest enemy? I would say uh, procrastination. Ooh. Procrastination. Um, would be the biggest enemy, not taking action or perfection. Which is eerily similar because sometimes perfectionists, yes. they actually suffer from analysis by paralysis. That's right. Which is till this day, I'm still working through working, working with that. Um, you know, I, I, I believe that, uh, there's a lot of perfection in me and I've learned it's actually not a strength. It's a weakness mm -hmm. uh, because of what you just said, right? It could like stop people from, doing or starting what they, what they want to do. Taking action and figuring That's it right. out. Um, what's your biggest fear, Junior? I would say uh, probably regret. 
not doing what, what it is that I want to do in life. Do you have a regret that you're thinking of right now or just in general, you wanna live a life? Yeah, I would say in general. Okay. A few more questions for you, my dude. Um, next one, I love this one because you're a purebred coach, right? You wanna like to coach and mentor. You're in the business of giving others uh, really good advice. Uh, from your perspective, what's one of the best pieces of advice that you've ever received and why? I would say, uh, Live out your passion, live out your dream. Go for it. Amen. Just do it. Like Nike. That's right. <laughs> All right, my friend, this has been awesome. My last question, the name of this podcast is the Fitness CEO Podcast, the Fitness Chief Executive Officer Podcast. Uh, from your perspective, Junior, what does it mean to be a CEO? CEO, I, I would say, first and foremost, you gotta lead by example. Uh, stay humble, stay hungry. Um, and go do what you, what you want to do. Well, my friend, uh, this has been awesome. And I wanted to, uh, before we wrap today, just want to thank you, um, not only for being here, sharing your wisdom, sharing your journey, sharing your story, uh, but just the way you show up, your heart, your passion for the crazy story that you, you know, family immigrated. We need more hardworking immigrants like you, the, the immigrant edge mentality that gives back, you know, your incredible uh, amount of service to our country and uh, what you're doing, how you're serving your community with your wife, with your family, uh, with your team has just been absolutely incredible. You're an awesome dude. And I want to thank you for all that. But more importantly, thank you for who you are. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to be here with you and uh, on your CEO fitness podcast. My Appreciate man. it. You got Thank it, my you. brother. Well, friends, I know you got a ton of value. My one ask is go ahead and like and share this video with someone in need that would help us continue to produce awesome content for you. And remember that no one is coming to save you. You must save yourself. And the time is now. We'll see you in the next episode.